Welcome, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is uh, an exercise we're going to do on the second part uh, of the talk. The, the first part of the talk before the break is only going to be uh, me talking, essentially. Uh, and then the second part is going to be the actual uh, hands-on coding. And uh, we'll be using this uh, Git repo. Uh, so if you want to take some time to uh, uh, Git clone it, uh, yeah, that, that'll save us some time afterwards. Maybe I'll, I'll leave it on for 30 seconds. All right, so HTTP2, I'm uh, Frederick Devet. I uh, work for Fastly. I'm a uh, senior manager there. I, uh, my team is the Edge uh, protocols team, uh, which means we essentially take uh, connections from browsers, and then we pass them on to upper layers so that they can do something interesting about the connections in questions. And so uh, to give you an idea of roughly the size we're uh, speaking on, Fastly is a CDN. Uh, which means our job is to deliver your content to your customers as fast as possible. Uh, and so this is a screen cap from our web uh, front page. Uh, if you go to www.fastly.com, uh, you'll see uh, current set. Um, we uh, take incoming connections, uh, incoming HTTP requests, and then we execute code on, code on them uh, so you can uh, modify the request uh, before it hits the, the origin. Uh, when we do look, uh, look up in the cache, uh, you can tweak it uh, before sending it, it back to the, to the browser. And you can decide, uh, decide whether, if the origin is down, you can decide whether to serve it a stale object or not. Uh, where my team fits in, into that is that uh, uh, since we provide the low layer, um, we uh, feed everything uh, we know about the connection to the browser. So that means um, the ciphers uh, that the TLS client presented uh, the cipher that ended up being negotiated, uh, but also the HTTP2 uh, details, like the stream ID, uh, is it a push? Or uh, you can actually send HTTP2 frames on the wire for uh, triggering a push to the, to the, uh, to the browser. Uh, in order to provide all this, we use H2O. H2O is a, an open source uh, server uh, written uh, by Kazuo Oku. Uh, principally, uh, we've been uh, contributing to, to it steadily over uh, these uh, last couple of uh, years. And Kazoo has joined us in 2016. Um, and so uh, we'll talk in a lot of more detail uh, on the second part of the talk about H2O itself. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, the basis we, uh, we use. It's a fantastic, uh, hackable uh, web server, very clean C code base. Uh, so HTTP2, I guess one way to uh, understand HTTP2 is to um, uh, ask us why the protocol itself was needed. And for this, let's take a look back at what uh, HTTP was uh, before uh, 7540 came out. Uh, so the HTTP1 that we all uh, grew to learn and love uh, was based on an RFC, uh, HTTP 1.1 2616, that was released in 1999. Uh, so the web was a, a very different place at the time. Um, it got an, a refresh in 2014. Uh, so to, uh, 2616 is actually obsolete. Uh, it got split into six different RFCs uh, that uh, rephrased some areas that were uh, a, little, uh, a little bit unclear. And it also tried to remove the transport from uh, the HTTP semantics themselves. Uh, so HTTP uses TCP, as you know. Uh, the, the first version of uh, HTTP uh, used TCP in a very naive way. So it would open a TCP connection, fetch a resource, download the resource, and then close the connection. If you were using SSL on top of that, you would also add the TLS handshake on top of that. Uh, HTTP was a slight improvement over that because uh, they realized that once the first resource was downloaded, they could actually start downloading uh, another one. So we would have a single TCP open. And for this TCP open, we would uh, fetch 
uh, objects until we were done with, uh, with the server. Uh, so this doesn't allow, for, for example, to get two objects at a time as, uh, uh, since you were only downloading one of the objects uh, at a given time. And the authors of the RFC already in 1999 realized that. And the RFC has a provision uh, instructing clients to actually only keep two open connections to the server so that you actually can download two objects at the same time. Uh, fast forward today, the browser has actually opened six connections. Uh, right? So here is, uh, I think it's Chrome. Uh, the little orangish uh, blobs are the connection opens. And you can see that the first connections uh, establishes, then fetches the HTML, then discovers there are more objects to download. And uh, so the, um, the browser actually respected the RFC at the beginning because it opened from the beginning, it, it opened two connections. And then once uh, the browser knows about all the objects it needs to download, it's gonna download six at the same time. Uh, this is another view of roughly the same thing. Uh, this is a very simple Im uh, HTML uh, with a bunch of images. And you can see here uh, that we're, we have sort of staircase where we're downloading the images six by six. Uh, so one way around the, the issue of fetching a lot of objects at the same time was uh, pipelining. So uh, that's, that was also part of the original 2616 RFC. Uh, and so essentially this allowed you to, uh, uh, if you wanted objects A, B, and C, you would ask for A, B, and C to the server, and then you would get A, B, and C uh, from the server. Uh, in that order, and that's the important part, uh, because that introduces uh, head of line blocking. Uh, so head of line blocking uh, is caused because the client has no way to know how large A is gonna be until uh, it actually uh, fetches it. So it might be that B and C are very small and you could start your JavaScript parser on them or your CSS parser uh, but you, they're stuck, in fact, be, uh, behind this large image uh, that you had no way to, to know was huge, and so you're, uh, you're delaying the parsing that you could start uh, behind this object on the, on the wire. Uh, the other manifestation of this uh, is the, uh, where when A is, for some reason, harder to compute uh, than B, and B or C, and so here, in this case, B or C could be in the cache of the server, could be served very fast, uh, because the, but because the client has asked for A, B, and C, B and C are stuck behind A. Uh, so there were attempts to improve this. Uh, this is a draft that actually never made it into an RFC, but it would add uh, an identifier in front of the response, so you could actually tell A, B, and C apart. Uh, but you can see that this solves the, uh, this issue where a is for some reason harder to compute because you can send B by send, uh, saying this is B. Uh, but it doesn't solve this issue uh, because if you're started uh, sending A, then you're stuck with sending A on the single TCP connection. Uh, another issue with HTTP 1 uh, was the request size. Uh, this is an extract from uh, a, a blog post that Dropbox made. And uh, can you tell when they switch to HTTP 2 on their uh, web API on a uh, um, data centers. So uh, essentially, uh, they were making a heavy use of uh, headers, and they had a lot of information going back and forth between the client and the servers. And you can, you can see here that when they switched to HTTP2, they start compressing headers, and they essentially divided their bandwidth by two. Uh, so I think this is a, like a, a, a very obvious case for header compression because it's API and so it uses uh, headers a little bit more than standard HTTP conversation. Uh, but it still shows that there's a lot of gain to be there. Uh, this is another example. Uh, this comes from uh, a session I did on my browser. If you go to uh, Chrome histograms, uh, the Chromium source code is actually uh, peppered with small hooks that allow to gather stats. And uh, there are many, many, uh, including the, how effective the compression was for uh, Speedy, uh, which is the old name for HTTP2 at Google, uh, compression was for headers. And so you can see here that the vast majority of headers on my session was compressed by more than 90%. Uh, so well, these limitations uh, introduce a lot of clever techniques that people use today in order to work around the limitations of HTTP. 
Uh, so these include domain sharding, uh, which essentially give different names to the same server so that instead of opening six connections, your browser is suddenly going to open 24 uh, to, your, uh, to your server, and so you obtain more parallelism there. Uh, another one is image sprites, where you're going to reduce the amount of requests you're going to do, because in a single request, you're going to obtain many, many images. JS and CSS concatenation are obey the same reasoning, and then inlining is against the same thing. Uh, the problem with all these techniques, of course, is that then you hurt your caching, uh, because if a single element of the GS JS concatenation changes, then you need to upload everything uh, anew to the client. Uh, so it, to sum up, uh, we had poor uh, concurrency and multiplexing, uh, no interleaving, uh, bad interaction with TCP, because TCP lives in an ideal world where uh, it tries to estimate the bandwidth between the connection and the server and it assumes it's uh, the, the single one on the client. And so if you start uh, to have many, many uh, TCP connections between your client and the server, then TCP has a hard time estimating the, the bandwidth, and you will have your different connections that compete with each other. Because uh, packet loss essentially, essentially for TCP means that uh, with uh, heat congestion, this hurts uh, in the long run the bandwidth of your TCP connections. Then finally, uh, the headers are large and repetitive. They've grown. Uh, we'll see in uh, more examples later uh, how big they get. Uh, and they're repetitive. Uh, when you set a cookie, you, set that cookie uh, you get this cookie over and over again from the client. So th this, uh, those are a lot of wasted bytes on the wire. So here comes in HTTP2. Uh, so HTTP2 takes the form of a, a new RFC uh, it's actually two. We'll see uh, the second one in two detail later. But the main one is 7540. Uh, it's uh, well written, I would say, as far as RFCs goes. It's uh, easy to uh, to parse, I would say, uh, like beginning to the uh, to the end. It's full with uh, nice examples and good justifications, I would say, for the different technical choices. Uh, so it started with Speedy. It was an uh, internal experiment at Google. Uh, so they essentially were they, they were essentially trying to uh, come up with uh, ways to improve the current HTTP, and they're in a unique position uh, position where they own both the browser on one side and the server, uh, or a lot of the traffic on the internet on the other side. Uh, and so they came up with Speedy uh, when a call for proposals was made by the HTTP working group. Uh, Speedy was used as the basis with the understanding that uh, any, everything on Speedy could be then rediscussed. Uh, but like this, use, uh, this was uh, the foundation of the, of the protocol there. So the result of the, the working group were two RFCs, 7540 and 7541. Uh, so the design goals, as stated in the HTTP working group charter, were to solve multiplexing and interleaving issue, where you have essentially this single connection that's stuck with a single download, uh, solve header bloat, allow more efficient implementations. Uh, so uh, HTTP being a text protocol, we'll see in detail, uh, it's a little, it makes it a little harder to, to write parser for it. Uh, but then I think one super important goal uh, to keep in mind is that they didn't touch anything else in HTTP. So they limited themselves to uh, only touch at the transport layer and then keep all the semantics, all the caching, uh, you know, who sets uh, a date header and what, the, uh, and what not, what was already um, uh, specified into HTTP and leave it as is. And I think that uh, today, uh, with uh, the benefit of a couple of years of being out in the field, I would say that they largely uh, solved that problem. Uh, so let's uh, take an analogy to uh, uh, explain what HTTP2 is. So let's say that you're in sand transport. And so you own a mountain, and uh, your customers ask you for sand, and your uh, job is to deliver the sand. So what you have for this is a very nice truck. And so when your customers ask for red sand, you shove it into the, into the truck. The truck goes to the customer, and then you come back uh, for more uh, orders. And so uh, you say this is a problem because uh, if I have two customers that are nearby, I cannot send two different types of sends. So you go and see the uh, sand transport working group and you ask them for a solution. 
And uh, 15 years afterwards, they come back and they say, uh, well, the solution to your problems isn't, is that you shouldn't be using a truck. Instead, you should be using containers. Uh, the reason our containers are versatile, you can stack them on top of each other. Um, and, you know, uh, it doesn't matter where the transport is, and so uh, this will solve your issue. I did, this, I did this very talk in Pittsburgh, and somebody from the audience that actually worked in sand transport came to me and, and told to me that they actually went through the same motion, and they are actually using uh, containers today uh, for sand transportation there. So how does it work? Uh, there are three components uh, of the, in the HTTP connection, in the HTTP2 connection, sorry. The first one is gonna, be, is gonna remain the same on the outer layer, it's the TCP connection. Inside, we're gonna have streams, uh, which are virtual channels of communications, but that are essentially gonna tell us, uh, allow us to tell apart with what is a, resp uh, what is a response and what is a request, and then, Inside the streams, there are frames, which are the actual bu buffers that we're gonna write into the wire. So it's a binary protocol, uh, which means that what you used to do, uh, which is telnet to a server and then write a bunch of text and then get uh, a response that you could understand, uh, is now much more complicated. Uh, this is establishing uh, an HTTP2 connection to uh, the same server. Uh, but as you can see, uh, it's sending a preface. This, this is the, the magic uh, that we use in order to, uh, like the secret handshake that the client and the server have in order to say, hey, I talk HTTP2. Then there's uh, ALPN, uh, which is the TLS layer negotiation, uh, which allows to select the protocol. Uh, and then you can see here in hex dump, this is the response we got back from the server. And so this is a frame. We'll see in detail uh, how, that, uh, how that works. This is another view of the same thing. Uh, so this is a small plan that I wrote. Uh, it doesn't look anything like that anymore. Uh, but I thought it was interesting because here we can see the different in blue is what the client is sending to it. So you can see again the same ma ma magic preface, the pre something. Uh, and then we send settings to the, uh, to the server, and then uh, we see a get slash request. And uh, the get slash request actually, uh, to give you a preview of what the, uh, the, the protocol looks like, 82, 84, 87 there mean uh, get slash on HTTPS. Uh, the, those are specified in the, in the RFC, and two stands for get, four stands for slash, and seven stands for HTTPS. So the good thing about this is that uh, it makes it a par a writing parser easier. If you've written any parser in C, uh, you know it's a pain because you need to check for two things at the same time. You need to, to check for the end of the buffer and you need to check for the character that signifies the end of what you're looking for, so CRLF in the HTTP case. Here, uh, the, because it's binary, uh, we have a prefix that gives us the length, so we know in advance what we're looking for, which means that allocation is easier, uh, you don't have to make any guesswork or any realogs in the way. Um, so uh, it's um, way more strict in terms of uh, how you uh, specify, uh, how the protocol is specified and how the parsers are written. Uh, the bad thing is that in order to troubleshoot, as, you'll, as we'll see, uh, we need the assistance of uh, third-party tools, uh, which means that there's this indirection level, and so there's always the chance that there's a bug into the, the tool itself, and so that makes it, uh, that makes it a little harder. Uh, certainly, I've been troubleshooting issues with uh, congestion control, for example, and I wouldn't say that was easy at all. Um, Another issue that, you, that comes up is that uh, it's not always obvious uh, what the HTTP translation should be in HTTP 1 when you're writing a proxy, uh, which is the case for H2O. Uh, and so there are some coordinate cases here that uh, we've tried to address along the way. Uh, so the connection itself, uh, it's a single uh, HTTP connection. So here we uh, get away with, uh, with the six connections that the browser would open. And so we will 
uh, be trying to use uh, TCP to its full maximum. And so we will give TCP what it thinks uh, it is, which is the, a virtual channel of communication between, and the single one, between the client and the server. Uh, so uh, in theory, we, have, uh, we, uh, we would uh, have better uh, detection of issues in TCP. We will see at the very end of this talk that uh, it's not uh, always as simple as that. Uh, there are two versions of the connection. Uh, there is clear text and uh, TLS. But my talk is only going to really look at the TLS version because that's the only thing that browsers today implement. There are some tools that uh, support H2C, which is the clear text version. But what's rolled out today is uh, HTTP2. Uh, sorry, is uh, H2, which is the secure, uh, the secure version. Uh, so. Because we're reusing port 443, and we're reusing port 443 essentially because the internet is littered with small middle boxes and that will block traffic if it's not something that they're vaguely familiar with. And so uh, uh, back in the days, uh, Google did a, a bunch of um, uh, attempts using dis different uh, TCP ports. And what they found out is that essentially, if you don't go through 443 or 80, then you're going to get stuck. So we're reusing port 443, which means that we need one way to differentiate whether we're talking H2 or HTTP1. And for that, we use ALPN. So that's what's in the final RFC. Uh, for a while, uh, the RFC actually specified another um, a mechanism, which is called NPN. And sometimes I know some Python libraries still uh, output error messages uh, that refer to NPN although most of the libraries today use ALPN. Uh, so this is what it looks like. This is actually a capture. It's probably too small, uh, but I enlarged uh, the, meeting, the, the meaning of the, the text. This is the client hello that's sent by the client uh, when establishing the TLS handshake. Uh, and it says, essentially, to the server, I support H2 and HTTP1. And then the server replies with server hello, where it's uh, going to send the cipher that the connection is going to use. But it's also going to send, well, uh, I understand H2, so let's use H2. And then from now on, everything on the connection is expected to be HTTP2. There are some restrictions with uh, how uh, you use TLS uh, on HTTP2. And so there's a full section on the RFC about that. SNI, for example, is mandatory. Uh, although I found that uh, not all servers uh, actually enforce it, uh, some servers will actually close the connection if there's no SNI inside the, uh, inside the client hello packet. Uh, there's no compression uh, because of the obvious attacks uh, that have plagued TLS for many, many years. Uh, the same for renegotiation. And it also specifies that you, it is mandatory that you support at least a cipher uh, that's, secure, that's known to be secure today. Uh, which uh, is to avoid downgrade attacks. So you're, uh, it actually lists uh, this, and uh, if you don't support that, then the, the, the server can reply uh, inadequate security uh, with an inadequate security message. Uh, one key thing is that uh, we want to be able to uh, uh, reuse this connection uh, because we've gone through all these pains of establishing the TCP and SSL connection, and this is expensive. Uh, we want to make uh, as much use of this connection as possible. Uh, so this is a query that I wrote uh, using BigQuery. HTTP Archive is a fantastic website. Uh, if you haven't taken a look yet, I encourage you to do. They essentially browse the, uh, the web and issue requests, and they gather statistics about it. So they gather how many objects were in the page. They, they use like the 1 million Alexa uh, list of websites, I think. Uh, and so how many objects were on the page, uh, how many CSS, uh, how many headers did we send, how many headers did we get back, et cetera. Uh, and they also record how many TCP connections we ended up opening, opening to a given page. Uh, and you can see that uh, the uh, number of connections has actually gone down. Uh, and HTTP2 is to be credited for that. We've gone from you know, 40 something uh, connections per page to around 30 uh, for, uh, per page now. So the connection can be reused if, the, if two conditions are met. The first one is, do the host name resolve to the same IP? And we, we will see in a second that this is complicated, actually. And the second one isn't that complicated, is the two host name must be on the subject alt name of the certificate. Uh, so both host name must be found there. 
in order to um, allow the server uh, to opt out from, uh, from a given response, there's a, the RFC introduces a new uh, status code, 421, and that's uh, to indicate to the browser that it should uh, actually reopen a connection in order to resend the request. Uh, until very recently, this wasn't support, uh, supported by, correctly by all the browsers. Uh, Chrome uh, had a bug open uh, where it would simply ignore the response. So the, your mileage uh, might vary with that. Uh, and so if you're susceptible to connection reuse, I would uh, advise you to take a, a second look at uh, how the browsers interact with that. Uh, so for the uh, name resolution, the browsers implement that, uh, that differently. So Resolving to the same IP for uh, Firefox means any time in my browsing session, I have seen these host names resolve once to the same IP. And so this is a little vague because the browsing session might last a while and the C names might actually have changed. Uh, but Firefox won't, won't resend uh, uh, revalidation in order to make sure that this is the case. And you could, you could uh, resolve to two IPs, right? On one hand, you could resolve to uh, uh, one IPv4 and one IPv6, and on the other hand, only IPv4. Uh, but that, for Firefox, that still means that uh, if the IP is the same, it can reuse the connection. Uh, Chrome is a little more conservative and will only actually open the connection to the same IP. So here's a graph to uh, re-explain the same thing. Uh, so let's say that Firefox has a A dot example and B dot example, and they both share the same IP. If Firefox open, happens to have already a connection open to A using 2.0, it's, it's still going to reuse the same connection for B, uh, which might be surprising. And if you're using C names to uh, do load balancing of any sort, this is something to be aware of uh, because your browsers are going to react differently. Um, I know uh, a common way to switch HTTP2 on is that you will uh, enable it for a subdomain, uh, but be careful that if the subdomain actually resolves to the same IP or it's in the same certificate, then the browser is totally going to ignore that and it's going to issue HTTP2 requests on the main site as well. Chrome is a little different. As I said, uh, it's a bit more conservative, so if the Connection, existing connection to A is not open on an IP that also resolves to C, then Chrome is actually going to reopen a different connection. Uh, so I would say that uh, this is slightly uh, more expected behavior. So yeah, uh, if you're using C names for testing, then keep this in mind because uh, it might not be enough anymore. It also means that domain sharding, it's not going to work as it used to if you're resolving to the same IPs. Uh, so inside the connection, we have the streams. Uh, and the streams are virtual channels of communications. And uh, the very simple uh, way to explain a stream is that the stream is a request and a response. Uh, the, the streams are uh, ordered. They're ever incrementing. So if you are sending a request on stream number five, then it means that you cannot send anything below five afterwards. The, Odd numbers are reserved for the client, so uh, 1, 3, 5, etc. is uh, for the client only, and the even numbers are for the server, so 2, 4, etc. They're all used by the server. Uh, so uh, the, the max is 2 to the power of 31, and if you reach that, you're simply uh, supposed to reopen a connection. Uh, this is a, a state diagram from the, the RFC. I think it doesn't need to be. Uh, it, it might not need to be that complicated, uh, but the, I guess the thing to keep in mind is that every stream that hasn't been closed yet is idle, which means it's fair game to use this for priorities, and we will see how Firefox uses them. And then uh, as you, uh, the communication goes on, the streams end up being closed, and then you, uh, you open new streams as new requests come in. Uh, because all these can be quite confusing. Uh, there's an RFC today that's, uh, that's uh, in discussion that actually uh, um, advises servers to open a well-known URL that, where you can dump the state. H2O implements that. So if you have this uh, enabled, then you can issue requests and debug uh, the server by having all the, the current state of all the connections. 
so internally, this can be a, uh, something handy to have uh, in order to troubleshoot connections. Uh, inside the streams, we have the frames, and the frames are the actual buffers we write to the uh, to the uh, to the wire. Uh, they all start with the same uh, prefix, so it's a fixed nine bytes header, and the very first three bytes of the the nine bytes are uh, the length of the of the remainder of the the frame. Uh, then there's a type, uh, which uh, there are different uh, head, uh, types for frames. We'll see that. Then flags that are specific to the type. Uh, then there's a reserve bit, uh, because no protocol is complete if there's no uh, reserve bit. And then there are uh, 31 bits for the stream identifier. I suspect that the reserve bit is there uh, to, so that there are no errors if, uh, between signed and unsigned. Uh, but that's uh, just a guess uh, on, my, on my part here. So if we go back to the, uh, the connection to Google here, uh, the very, uh, sorry, the uh, the line under get is actually a header frame where 23 is the length, and then one is the type, and then uh, 0, 05 is the are the flags, uh, and then 0, 0, 0, 001 is the stream ID. And then we have the and what follows there is the payload with uh, 82, 84, 87, uh, which were the get slash HTTPS. Uh, and above get, we have a settings, and so settings, it's a different type. Uh, it's zero length, uh, which uh, explains why we see uh, three zeros, then four, which is the settings type, uh, and then uh, all zeros because the stream ID for settings frames is always zero. Uh, so in order uh, to map HTTP 1 to HTTP 2, uh, here's what the HTTP 1 uh, connection would have looked like. And uh, in HTTP 2, we would have actually sent a header frame with uh, everything in the first request, which means that get slash, as you uh, know now, because we've seen that in the get example in the previous slide, uh, they are all uh, actually pseudo headers. So there's a colon method uh, header that, uh, whose value is get, and then a colon method path uh, whose value is slash, etc. And so essentially, the payload for headers frame is all key values. Uh, so there's no special uh, like uh, request line. And the same on the uh, server side. So there's no special uh, status line either. Uh, there's a column status special pseudo, pseudo header whose value is going to be 200. Uh, and then uh, there's going to be the server, the content type, et cetera, uh, just as uh, in HTTP 1. And then all the body for the response is all going to be data frames. And that's how we're going to send stuff to the wire. If your headers are super long, suddenly, then you can use continuation headers. And that's the, uh, the reason we have a separate uh, set of headers. So the protocol flow, what used to be in HTTP 1, uh, so, uh, sorry. Uh, so the protocol flow is uh, uh, send stream, on stream ID, I send headers for the get slash, et cetera. And then I get the response uh, from the server also on stream ID 1, which is how we match the request and the response. And then we get, once we get the headers uh, out, we send the data afterwards. Uh, so what used to be uh, six connections simultaneously, simultaneously on the same, uh, to the same server becomes a single connection where we have all the frames interleaved uh, with different stream IDs. Uh, this is another view of the same thing. This is a waterfall for HTTP 1 uh, to a website that has many, many resources. And you can see, uh, although it's a bit small at this distance, but there's this familiar six connection staircases. And this is the exact same website accessed through HTTP 2. And you can see that once the very first connection at the top has fetched the HTTP 1, and then it's discovered all the resources, it's able to send all the requests on one go to the server. And uh, the download of the resources is going to start immediately. And then somewhere half the connection, presumably uh, some parsing of JavaScript or CSS is done, and you've discovered new resources, and you send new resources to the server. Uh, but here you can see one advantage uh, of having smaller requests, because uh, now that you've managed to compress the headers uh, sometimes to a couple of bytes, then you're able to, uh, in a, to fit in a single TCP packet, you're able to fit uh, you know, tens uh, of requests in the same TCP packet. 
so this is a look at the frames inside Wireshark. Uh, this is a connection from uh, Firefox. And we're going to zoom in into uh, one frame. Uh, so in blue, we have the like, TCP and TLS layer. And in green, we have the HTTP2 um, uh, level frames. And here, uh, we're zooming into the data, uh, the response from the server. So you can see uh, that we have, like, the very first line is the magic and settings, et cetera. And we'll discuss about how Firefox sets up the connection. And then we have, uh, following this, we have a headers and a window update. We'll see what window update means. But headers there is the get slash. And then uh, there are settings exchange. We'll see into the, uh, this into the detail, detail later as well. And then finally, there's the headers and data, which are the response from the server. And so if we zoom in into the servers and data, uh, you can see that Wireshark has actually, uh, so the first thing to notice is that they're part of the same TCP packet, right? So we've put the, the, two, uh, the two frames belonging to a given stream uh, to the, into the same TCP packet. Uh, the stream ID is 13. And if we zoom into the headers frame, then we can see the key values that Wireshark has decoded for us. And we have the pseudo header status 200, uh, which uh, starts the, the key values of the response. So the frame types, uh, we've seen already the three that roughly map to uh, known features of HTTP 1, right? The data, uh, the headers, and the continuation. Headers and, co and continuation are uh, pretty much synonymous, at least in my mind. Uh, and then data is for everything that has to do with the body. It's used both for the body of the response and the body of the request. Uh, then we have the settings, uh, which is uh, how uh, 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 different components uh, negotiate com uh, uh, settings for the connection. Then we have two mechanisms uh, to end connections. One is uh, only has to do with the stream. Um, which might, you might have started downloading something and you don't want uh, it anymore, and so you send a reset stream. And so that resets a single stream inside the TCP connection. And then there's go away, which is a, a graceful way to shut down the connection. Uh, go away actually allows you to specify which is the last request that you properly handled. So that means that if you have many, many requests in flight, you are still telling the browser, well, the last one I'm going to treat is number x. And then the browser can assume that all the rest has been ignored. Uh, there's a, a nice section on the RFC that actually uh, describes how to use go away in sequence in order to obtain graceful uh, shutdowns so that you can take your uh, server down with uh, all the browsers finishing the downloads and then knowing exactly what's the last request that they've, they've treated, sorry. Uh, then we have ping. Uh, ping is simply a way to keep the connection alive. It used to be uh, that uh, Google's server sent that, uh, but I'm not seeing any server send this anymore. And I think that Firefox has experimented this because we were seeing pings from the client, uh, but I'm not sure that all the Firefoxes do that. So uh, the, the uses of this in the field seems to be like, quite experimental so far. Uh, then we have three frames that, are, that have to do with new features in HTTP, uh, which are the priority, push promise, and window update frames that we'll see in detail later. Uh, so they're extensible, which means that if you see a frame that you don't know about, you're supposed to ignore it. Uh, and I expect that uh, we will actually see an active use of this, because this is, uh, it's, it's been done in a way that uh, Client and servers can negotiate new features on that. There are al already at least three efforts I know of. The first one is the origin frame, uh, which allows the server to um, reduce the scope of the number of servers that it's actually serving. Uh, so this has to do with the connection reuse issue I was telling you about. So you might have a, um, a certificate that handles you know, thousands of domains with wildcards, et cetera. And so the origin frames allows actually the server to uh, reduce the set of domains that it's willing to serve. Uh, then there's cache digest, uh, which is, uh, has to do with knowing the state of the client. We will see when we talk about push why that's important. And then there are uh, the exchange of uh, compression uh, dictionaries between the client and the server uh, in order to provide even more uh, efficient compression mechanism for the higher layers. 
Uh, so the the, uh, the settings frame itself uh, is negotiated. Uh, it's actually not really a negotiation. It's both sides mandates to the other what the limits it's going to abide to uh, are. And so it uh, defines the number of maximum concurrent stream, uh, for example. As you've seen, uh, you can now send many, many requests uh, to the server on one go. And the settings frame actually allows you to control how many of those you're willing to treat at a given time. Uh, there's the maximum window size, etc. And so they are sent on both sides, and then both sides send, uh, send acknowledgement. And then the, the, request can, uh, uh, the, re the request flow can start. Uh, so here, this is our same Firefox, and we're going to zoom into uh, uh, the first TCP packet, where we have the magic preface with pre, etc. Uh, and then we have the settings frame. And inside the settings frame, you can see here that uh, Firefox sets two settings. The first one is the uh, initial window size to 128K. And the second one is the maximum phrase size, uh, which is 16K, uh, which is uh, roughly a TLS record. Uh, so that's uh, why that's the, the default of the RFC here. Uh, there are a couple of settings. Again, you are supposed to ignore the settings you don't know about. So that's the same thing for frames. Uh, so that, that's extensible. And so by uh, the first one, header table size is how much state you are willing to uh, set aside for HPAC. Uh, this is so that uh, clients or servers uh, with low memory footprint can actually implement the, the protocol. You can opt, at, opt out of push by setting a, a, a settings, uh, etc. And uh, so on the, the right hand side, there are the defaults uh, specified in the RFC. So HPAC, uh, this is a, so it's a huge uh, specification and uh, it, it is uh, a bit complicated because it has many different parts and it, it defines everything from the ground up. So how you encode an integer, et cetera, is all re-specified. Uh, and uh, uh, it only concentrates on how to compress headers. It's actually something that you could reuse outside of HTTP, right? So uh, the uh, 7540 refer refers to the HPAC RFC, but you could uh, use HPAC for something else. Uh, and it addresses the issue of header bloat. This is a grep that I did on a uh, live traffic, uh, and I'm cutting the number of uh, header bytes that we see, we see in the request. And you can see that uh, around, uh, how much is it? I forget. Uh, but like around 5% of the, the oh, sorry, 10% of the packets are about uh, 3K. And so um, on, Old uh, OSs or old TCP stacks, uh, for example, Mac OS X, the um, uh, initial congestion window is, is set to three MSS. Uh, so that means that if you're above 4.5 uh, kilobytes, you're not going to be able to send your request on a first, uh, on a first packet. And so it's actually a big issue, a bigger issue with HTTP because you want to, uh, as soon as you've downloaded the HTML and you discover all the resources that are on a page, you want to be able to send as much requests as possible. And so uh, uh, HPAC uh, attempts to address that. Uh, so we want more requests to fit in the initial smaller TCP window, uh, and you can save a round trip in TCP uh, with the help of that. So it addresses the issue in two ways. The first one is uh, Huffman encoding, and the second one is index tables, where you have a mapping from one byte to a, a value or a key value. Uh, Huffman encoding, the principle is fairly simple, is uh, if you have a character that's used very often, like A, uh, you're going to use five bits to encode it. And if you have something that's less uh, often used, like uh, backslash, then you're going to use 19 bits, right? So uh, the hope is that by the end, on average, you will have saved a couple of bytes. Uh, then the other mechanism is a static table. Uh, or table, sorry. And the, the, the tables are either static or dynamic. And the static table is mandated of the RFC, so it's actually uh, hard-coded. It's been done, done by sampling actual live HTTP traffic. And they've looked at what the more often headers were, and they've put them on a table. So you have, have as we saw uh, in the first example with the get with 82, 84, 87, 80 essentially means the static table. Uh, then we have two, four, and seven here, uh, which map to the path 
being slash, the scheme being HTTPS, and uh, uh, I forget, the method uh, being get. Right, so this allows you to map in a single byte all the, either the, both the key and the value, or only the key in the case for the, the headers below. Uh, then the dynamic tables uh, are tables that you build as the connection goes, right? So you're, uh, as you send headers, you can instruct the server to say, hey, this sender has ju I just sent you, this cookie header, for example, set, set it in your dynamic table, and then I'm going to refer to it in the subsequent uh, requests with a single byte. And so, uh, because obviously this would be an attack vector because you could make the server store many, many different contexts. The server is allowed by the settings table to advertise a given amount of uh, memory it's setting aside for HVAC. Uh, the default value for this is 4K, and uh, I know that some, some uh, servers actually exp has, have expanded this, and what we see now is 16K uh, being actually quite common in, uh, in terms of uh, size set aside for HVAC. The compression context is as associated with the connection, which means that the, if the connection goes away, then you need to rebuild the entire dynamic table. Uh, so that's an incentive to keep the connection open for a long time, because then you're uh, able to use header compression more effectively. Uh, so this is an example of uh, how it works. It's taken from the RFC, uh, which is uh, as a very nice detailed uh, example section. Uh, and so you can see now, um, uh, this is only the payload, so there's no frame. Uh, but here we go through the, the decoding process of um, a get for HTTP on example.com. And so by now, the 82, 86, and 84 should be familiar. So they map directly to the static table. And then we have 41, which maps to the authority uh, header. And then we have a Huffman encoded value for www.example.com. And then at the very bottom, we have the new state of the HPAC context in the server. So that means once this request has been processed, then the server can now uh, store this new header it didn't know about, and then subsequent requests will make use of it. And this is the subsequent, uh, sorry, uh, this is the subsequent request. So you can see that the subsequent request is essentially the same, except it has one more, uh, one more header, the cache control no cache. And the second request is actually smaller because the uh, subsequent request is able to uh, uh, refer by a single byte to the already known uh, authority dub, 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 dub example .com header that it sent. In order to make, uh, make compression slightly more efficient, uh, all the headers are lowercase. So here, HTTP2 is taking advantage of something that was specified in the, uh, the old uh, HTTP1 RFC. Uh, which is that headers are case insensitive. And so they simply uh, lowercase all the headers. So lowercase is actually mandatory in HTTP2, uh, uh, which is uh, most of the issues we've seen when switching from HTTP1 to HTTP2 have been due to this. Uh, like, for example, when you sign your headers, if you don't lowercase all the headers before, or if you do that in a case, case sensitive way, then we will break. the signing will break. Uh, because the, all the compression attacks, uh, you could leak a very small amount of information by the size of the packets in the Huffman encoding, right? So suppose that you are sending a cookie. If it, if it has many A's, then it's going to look smaller on the wire, even uh, via TLS encryption, than if it contains only backslashes. So in order to uh, support that, then uh, you can actually opt out of compression. So you can tell the server, never ever actually uh, uh, compress this and never store it in your context. Uh, this is something that, for example, Firefox does uh, systematically for all the cookie headers. And this is the, something that we also added to H2O for the cookie headers. Uh, if you are recompiling H2O, you can actually select which headers uh, you don't want to do that for. Uh, because you have many, many requests being outstanding on the, on the wire, and you know, you've reduced the size, so now you're able to send hundreds of requests to the server, you uh, are now faced with a problem that you didn't have before, is that your server is now responding to you with hundreds of responses at the same time. 
And so in order to give you some, uh, some control of it, where, what the server is sending to you, there are two features that HTTP2 introduces. And the first one is flow control. Uh, so the flow control is a hop by hop uh, system um, put on, on top of, uh, of TCP. So TCP has its own existing flow control, but HTTP2 uh, allows to control the streams and how they are sent to you. It's a very simple credit-based system. So essentially, as a server, you start with a 100K, for example, of credit. And as you send data frames, then you reduce credit by as much data frames you sent. And then the client sends you back window updates, which up your credit, and you can send data frames again. So uh, here's how it looks. Uh, you uh, get one resource from the server, and you get the headers and then the data, and then you stop because you don't have any credits anymore, and then the client sends you more window updates, and then you send more data. The flow control only applies to data frames. So obviously, you can always send uh, control messages, you can send settings, and you can send as much window updates as you need. Uh, by default, it defaults, uh, there's both a, a, con a connection level window update, which means that the, there's a, cr a global credit for all the streams, and then there's a per stream credit. So uh, essentially, as a server uh, or as a, uh, as a peer, I guess, uh, you are sending two updates for the, uh, when you're sending your data because you're sending one for the stream and one for the, for the connection level. Uh, they, can, uh, they can be negotiated. So uh, one, one thing that we see typically is that when you connect to a server, it's, it, the server, if you're a high-performance server, you want the client to send you as much requests as it wants. So one of the very first things that you will see on the connections when we experiment with them is that the servers actually send you huge window updates uh, in order to maximize your, uh, your window so that you, can, you are not limited by the HTTP2 level. Um, uh, congestion uh, control. I think that uh, one other use case for this is that if you have a reduced memory uh, footprint because you're in an embedded system, this will allow you to both send many requests so that the server can prepare them, but also reduce the, the flow by which the server is sending the responses back to you. Uh, so flow control cannot be disabled. So contrary to pushes, for example, where you can simply opt out, uh, there you, you, even if you're writing a, tall, a toy HTTP to client, you're still going to have to send window updates uh, because there's no way to uh, really disable that. Uh, negative windows are legal. So if midstream you send a settings that negotiates a new level for connections, uh, then you can. Uh, then you don't need to abort the connection. You simply need to wait to get more credits in order to send more more data back. The other mechanism in order to control what the server is sending to you are the priorities. And so this is actually something that I see more uh, used. Uh, what we see in the field is that Windows updates uh, are really maxed out so that you can send as much as possible. But then priorities are what the browsers are using in order to get what they think is more important as fast as possible in the browser. Uh, so uh, it helps to manage the concurrency because it allows you to build a tree, essentially, of dependencies so that the server knows, knows what you want first. Uh, there are two ways to set priorities. Uh, one is to embed the priority into the header frame. And the other one is to send a priority frame. Right, so you might change your mind about what's important midstream. So uh, because, for example, you've executed a new JavaScript, and so uh, you're able, you can reprioritize streams on the fly, and the server will actually respect that. Uh, priority streams can be sent uh, sent in any state. Uh, that part is important uh, because. Uh, you can essentially use any stream that you've ever sent in order to, to build your priority tree. Uh, there are three components to the priority. The first one is the, the weight. So the higher, the better. And so if you have two streams that, have the, that are on the same level in the tree, but one has a higher weight, it will get more resources. Uh, the other one is the parent ID. That's how you build your, your tree, because streams can be dependent one on, one on each other. And then there's the exclusive flag, uh, which allows uh, you to say, hey, this new stream completely replaces all the existing children, and that's how you reorganize your, uh, your tree. 
so here's an example of uh, how it works. Uh, you have uh, stream zero, which is at the root, and every single stream uh, depends on stream zero by default. And you have A and B, A as a weight of 12, and B as a weight of four. And so you add all the weights at the same level, and then you're, at the end, you're gonna give three quarters of the resources to A and one quarter of the resources to B. Uh, the RFC goes into great length of uh, uh, describing how streams work, etc., but it doesn't specify what resources mean. So it's open to the implementer to actually decide uh, what uh, three quarters of the resources mean. What it means in H2O is that we have a O1 scheduler for priorities and we will give 16 kilobyte slices to each stream. So here in this example, we would write three uh, streams for A, and the, uh, sorry, three frames for A of 16 bytes and one frame for B, and then go back to A and then one B. Uh, I mentioned this because it might be surprising for smaller assets. Uh, you might wonder why you get A and then B. Uh, the reason is if, that if they're small enough, then they're gonna fit into a single frame and uh, you're gonna get them at the, at the same time. As I mentioned, uh, the uh, dependencies can be exclusive. So uh, here's uh, a different example where D and C have, a, where D has a weight of one and C has a weight of eight. But because uh, C is the ex exclusive dependent of D and D is the exclusive dependent of zero, then the download of C is only gonna start when D is done. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, this is how Chrome actually uses priorities. Uh, this is a slightly more complicated example. So here you download all of D, then C, and then you'll share the resources between A and B. If, uh, if C is done, uh, uh, sorry, no, yeah, uh, it, oops, it's the next example here. So here's a slightly more example, uh, a my, a slightly more complicated example. If C is done here, then A and B are gonna be, become children of D, right? So that's how the trees get uh, uh, evolved as the download progresses. So C disappears and then become dependent on, on D. So the browsers actually use these, uh, these tools in a very, very different way. Uh, Firefox, at the beginning of the connection, will send you priority frames in order to establish uh, this priority tree. And so they will send you, uh, how much is that? Six priority frames, dependent on uh, stream zero, with different weights, uh, and it's gonna attach the different requests uh, depending on the stream. This is actually something I read this week because the, my old slides and the Wireshark captures that I did don't match this anymore. Firefox has changed the way they set up their tree. And so uh, I mentioned this because uh, this is something to keep an eye on. I think that's still evolving because the browsers don't fully know uh, what's best for the pages. And so there's, uh, uh, there are some experiments going on. Uh, so this is the tree uh, once you've started download, downloading assets. So HTML is gonna be attached to stream 13, which is gonna get the maximum weight of the, of the downloads. Then uh, the JavaScript, which is in green here, is gonna, attach, uh, gonna be attached in different priorities depending on where it is in the page. So I've done experiments with JavaScript uh, defer, JavaScript async, uh, with a uh, JavaScript in the body or JavaScript in the head. And so you can see that they're attached at different, uh, different steps depending on the, the different characteristics of the JavaScript. And so images and JavaScript defer get the lowest priority possible uh, here below in stream 11. And CSS, for example, gets, uh, it's on the same level as uh, CSS and JavaScript head are in the same level as, as HTML. Uh, with a slightly lower weight, and then below we have the head async and JavaScript in the body. And so this tree stays for, uh, open for the, uh, this original tree here uh, stays open for all the, the duration of the connection. And uh, Firefox is simply gonna attach the, at different points in the tree depending on the, the, the type of the request. Uh, so here, the, here is the, how the tree is set up. Uh, so in the very first TCP packet, uh, we're, sending, uh, we're receiving all the priority streams from, uh, from Firefox. 
Uh, here we have the, the magic, the settings, the window, window update to maximize the, the amount of uh, information that the server can send to us. And then we have the uh, different uh, priority streams that are sent to open the tree. You can see here, uh, I was saying this, uh, my slides are updated. Uh, are outdated. Uh, the Wireshark is here, it's old, and uh, it didn't have stream 13 at the, at the time. Chrome, on the other hand, does a very different thing. Uh, they actually ask the server to make all the streams depending on each other. So uh, it's, if you have HTML, you're going to uh, depend on stream zero. And then if you have G uh, CSS, then you're going to depend, uh, uh, start being downloaded right after C uh, the HTML, then JavaScript, and then images. Um, so you can uh, see here that one of the downsides of this is that you are not going to interleave the downloads, which means that if you have progressively loadable images, then you're gonna, not going to take advantage of that at all. Uh, I think there's a little bit of discussion inside the Chromium project in order to change that. Uh, I've seen strong opinions. Uh, I don't know uh, really what works best. Uh, there's also an effort uh, to make a browser API that, act, that allows you to tweak the priorities. And I would, in my opinion, that's actually what's going to work best because uh, they're uh, in the order of people that know what priorities should be. There's the developer of the page, then there's the browser, and then there's the server, right? And so if you have the controls on what you want to load first, then I think that will be the best. But this is the de default behavior. I actually wrote a tool called H2 Priograph that takes uh, Chrome internals data and that, uh, for a given page, and that shows you how Chrome reordered uh, the different streams. And so what happens actually is that uh, you know if your uh, Chrome has asked for HTML and then an image and then it discovers the CSS, then it reorders the the stream to put the CSS in front, and so the the image is going to stop being sent by the server, and the CSS is going to take higher priority. Uh, so uh, one. Um, one consequence of that is that this kind of reintroduces head of line blocking, right? Because uh, again, you have no real way uh, to know how big the object is. Well, so in HTTP, you, you could know, but uh, that's still how the browser reorders them. And you can see that there's uh, a sort of uh, cascade where all the downloads are uh, put one behind the other. I think the advantage, though, is that the server knows right off the bat what all the requests are, so it can start processing internally in order to fetch the resources. This is Microsoft's Edge <laughs> priority tree. <laughs> uh, and so this is Safari, which actually does a better job. Uh, so HTML gets most of the resources. And it actually might work well. I haven't, uh, I haven't, uh, I'm like a backend developer mostly, so I haven't uh, really looked at the, the effect on this. But here you can uh, see that they use the, the weight of the HTML uh, to the maximum in order to get it first, uh, which I think makes sense. And then JavaScript, uh, no matter where it is, uh, gets uh, the same weight. Uh, and then images the, the, very, the very less priority. Uh, server push, so that's another HTTP2 feature. So it's the ability from the server to push uh, requests to the client before the client even requests them. Uh, I heard somebody uh, compare that to uh, reading a book and getting the pages uh, as you go. Uh, so it's an hop by hop thing, uh, which means that if you're behind a proxy, unless you have special support in the proxy, the push is only going to go to the proxy, and then uh, it won't necessarily be pushed to the client unless you do uh, something special on the proxy. Only the server can push, uh, so uh, the and, and the client can opt out. So you are going to use even numbered frames because those those are the reserved one for for the server, and you're going to send the, the request that way. So the way it works on the wire is that first you receive a request for slash, for example. Then you send the response for uh, stream ID one, and then you're going to send a push promise. So that's a special, uh, a special frame with a different type that contains both the headers uh, the stream ID it refers to, and then the headers that the server has actually made up in order to fetch the request. 
And then it's going to send uh, the data, the headers and data frame that are, sorry, the, yeah, the headers and data frame that are, um, that match the, the push promise. Uh, so if you, if you need more space than a push promise, is as headers, you send a continuation frame, frame you include the, the promise stream, uh, and then the way the client opts out the push promise is by sending a reset. And so you can see that this is racy. If you have a long TTL, then you might have sent you know, four meg megabytes over the wire already by the time you get the reset from the client. So uh, this is one of the things that makes HTTP push complicated. Uh, you cannot push anything. So um, the RFC actually instructs you to use only safe method for caching, so get, head, et cetera. And the way the client uh, controls how many uh, pushes are sent is through the maximum concurrent streams in the settings frame. Uh, so this is uh, the push in action. You can see the, the very first uh, connection that's established with uh, the orangish uh, uh, thing uh, showing what the connection establishment is. And you can see that right off the bat, uh, as soon as the, the first object is received, we actually start downloading uh, the other objects. So there's no, there's no request time, if you want. Everything is downloaded. So one of the problems with that is that, essentially, when you are pushing, you are making a bet. You are betting that the client doesn't have the resources, and what you are willing to trade is bandwidth. Uh, in order to make this bet, bet a little bit safer, uh, there are mechanisms for that. So uh, one is called uh, Casper, uh, which is cookie-based, where the server sets a cookie uh, that some, in something that it's called a golem set, uh, and I'm not a mathematician, so I cannot describe you what it is, but essentially I imagine it to be something like a bloom filter. So it's a compressed way to know if something is in the set or not. And so you set this cookie to the client, and so you get a picture of what's inside the cache of the client. And so if a resource is already in a set, then you are not re-downloading it. There's also an HTTP extension to do the same thing, to carry the information about what's in, inside the, uh, the cache of the client. Another uh, very simple way, I think, to work around the issue, uh, if you don't have access to either two, is that you set a cookie that expires after a day, and if the cookie is present, then you don't push. Google wrote a fairly detailed document that I encourage you uh, to take a look at, explaining why it's so complicated to get good results with push. Uh, they have to do with uh, what I described, that uh, there's this race between how much you've pushed already on the wire and you get the reset stream. Uh, there's the fact that uh, sometimes you need a cookie to fetch a resource, so it's difficult to know exactly what to push un un unless you know tightly what the application wants. Um, and so the clear use case, to me at least, for pushing is that you want to use the server think time. So for example, let's say that you have a slash that takes a while to compute, um, let's say a second. This is like a super good time to be pushing stuff because nothing is going to go in the wire. And so you're not losing anything there in that bet. Otherwise, if all the resources are already in the cache, and you, if you have a small RTT, then uh, it's not always obvious that push is going to help you. So uh, there are uh, ways to, uh, um, you, uh, in order to use the thinking time, H2O uh, parses the preload header. And so it discovers the resources that you can, uh, uh, that you can push. And so uh, the way you would use the, the thinking time is that you send a 1xx early hints. I think it's 103 now because it has made into a, a draft uh, now. And so if you send a 103 with early hints, you can send a link preload header, and the server will know what to push. Uh, the other way is that uh, 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 you find one way to push from the edge. So if you're a CDN, uh, like Fastly has support uh, for pushes, then you can, as soon as you receive the request, you can write push frames and send the, the, the content directly to the client. Uh, so we've gone through all this way. We've introduced all these features uh, for HTTP2. Uh, now is the time to see what it gets us. Uh, and like the, the promise was performance. And so it's a bit complicated. 
to assess what the performance is. And part of it is that there are many parameters uh, to, to take into account. This is an old paper that compared Speedy to HTTP 1, but I think it's mostly relevant here. And so on the left-hand side, we have uh, where Speedy performs better, depending on uh, factors like RTT, the object size, uh, packet loss, et cetera. And then on the right, there are the cases where uh, HTTP 1 still performs better. And essentially, if you have a big object and you have big RTTs and you have a lot of packet loss, then HTTP 1 is going to be best. Uh, we've used web page test. If you uh, don't use it yet, I uh, strongly encourage you to take a look at it. It's, uh, it's uh, an open resource where you can run tests from uh, VMs with actual servers, uh, sorry, actual browsers. And you can set different profiles for packet loss and bandwidth. And uh, you have uh, like access to Chrome, uh, Firefox, and uh, Internet Explorer. You can, uh, it can save TCP dumps for you, so you can uh, look into a lot of detail uh, into what the client has done. And so we uh, use all these uh, and run thousands of tests against uh, both true um, made up pages to understand better and actual uh, servers. And so here at the very top on the left, we have zero packet loss. And in orange, we have HTTP 1, how long it took to load the page on average. And each dot is a single experiment. And, at the, uh, and as we progress uh, to the right and then to the bottom, we've added more packet loss. So uh, the first one to the right, you can see that the difference between HTTP 1 and HTTP 2 is getting a little narrower. Uh, and we are only 0.5% of packet loss. And then at the bottom, if we're, uh, on the left, we're at 1%, where like, the, the difference is even muddier. And then uh, at the very end, we have 2% packet loss. And we, uh, you can see that HTTP 1 actually uh, perform, is on par with HTTP 2 there. Uh, this is another view of the same thing. So it's a curb that. Uh, computes how long it took for X percent of pages to complete. Uh, and so you can see that the blue curve is on top for most of the time until 2%, and then HTTP, HTTP 1 takes over. So the reason for that is that there's a, this single TCP connection we've been talking about for all this talk. Right? So this is a TCP in the ideal connections conditions. So you can see the slow start, and eventually we settle in, in a nice fat bandwidth, and everything goes well. Uh, but the problem is that as soon as you start seeing packet loss, then packet loss is interpreted by TCP as uh, the fact that you've hit the maximum bandwidth for the link, uh, which sometimes is true, but sometimes you're just on a mobile and you, you just went through a tunnel, and so there's no good reason to uh, reduce the bandwidth there. And so you can see that as soon as you start having packet loss, then your your uh, uh, TCP uh, congestion window is crippled by, the, by it. This is the same thing for HTTP 1, but in HTTP 1, you have six connections. So if you do the aggregate, well, uh, first, there are, there are less chances that a given connection is impacted. But then if you add up all the congestion windows, then you get a better, better result with, uh, with HTTP 1. So this is, to me at least, that's an example uh, that, sh that shows that depending on, on the application, it's possible that domain sharding could still be relevant for HTTP 2. Like you would have, obviously, to you know, uh, do the, the right thing with certifi certificates or IPs. But you, it might make sense to have at least two HTTP connections uh, open to the, to the browser in order to reduce the impact of packet loss. Uh, so this is a real web page that compares uh, HTTP 2 load times and you can see that the difference is not, a, not obvious at all between HTTP, HTTP 2 and HTTP 1. It does perform slightly better, but uh, uh, it's not as decisive as uh, one uh, might thought. Uh, the other thing that we've played with is that, uh, you know, since we have six connections for uh, HTTP 1, it's not entirely fair to compare that to the single HTTP 2 connection. So in, uh, in our systems, we let the customer control the initial congestion window. So you can actually tweak the TCP parameters of the connection that's coming in. So we've done some experiments that actually multiply the initial congestion window by 60, so that uh, at least at the beginning of the connection, you would be on the same footing as HTTP 1. And so here, 
uh, at the very, uh, in orange still, so at the very right at the beginning, with, uh, we have HTTP 1. And then we have the different results for uh, HTTP 2, depending on uh, 20 and 45 uh, uh, initial congestion window. And you can see that it helps a little bit, and like uh, 40, for 45 is faster most of the time. But then as you start seeing backend loss, uh, what we see on our systems is that it doesn't really improve things. Uh, so in terms of implementations, uh, all the browsers today support HTTP2. So as soon as you enable HTTP2 on your uh, server, uh, you will see a lot of the connections being HTTP2. What we see on our systems is uh, 25%, and that's because the old customers haven't switched to HTTP2 yet. Uh, on the server side, there are plenty of options. Uh, you know, all the, all the big ones supported uh, Nginx, Apache, uh, and I cannot recommend H2O enough. Uh, and then in terms of tooling, uh, we have this uh, indicator uh, called the uh, HTTP and Speedy indicator that's available in both Firefox and Chrome. Uh, it's super handy to have because if you click on the icon, then it uh, lands you on the Chrome internals, uh, net internal space for HTTP2. So if you're troubleshooting uh, and you're interested in the low level aspects of the connection, uh, this is super handy to have. Uh, there's the Chrome net internal page, which is uh, quite fancy, uh, I must say. You can see here, uh, by the way, a connection coalescing in action on the second row, uh, because you, you, you have all the domain names that are mapped into a single uh, TCP connection. Uh, and then if you click on the ID that's in blue, uh, then you can zoom in the connection in question, and you will have all the frames uh, that have been sent by the, by the browser. Chrome uses internally slightly different names, uh, but you uh, should be able to figure out uh, what maps to what, uh, what between Chrome and HTTP2. Uh, there's H2A, that's a man-in-the-middle proxy. Uh, so that's, uh, that's actually quite handy. Uh, it dumps all the frames that it sees between the, the browser and the client. Uh, the thing to keep in mind is that because it is a proxy and a lot of mechanisms in HTTP2 are hop by hop, uh, like push and window updates, etc. cetera, uh, depending on the problem that you are uh, trying to troubleshoot, it might not be the ideal tool there. Curl supports HTTP2 since a, a good number of releases now. It's actually based, the stack is actually based on ng-HTTP, uh, which is a stack that a lot of servers and clients use. Uh, it's very well written, uh, it's super easy to, uh, to use, and I think like a Node.js um, stack is, writ is written on top of HTTP2. And um, uh, oh, another web server, the, the name escapes me now. And then, and then Curl. Uh, so that's ng-http2. Uh, not only it is a library, but uh, it's also uh, a client, full-fledged client, and it dumps all the frames. And you can see that it tries to mimic Firefox, actually. So it sends priority frames in order to set up the same tree that Firefox does. Uh, then in terms of language, there's a, a Python library, Ruby library. Uh, it's part of the Golang language. So um, if you, uh, if you actually, it, it's possible that if you only upgrade Go, uh, you will start speaking HTTP2 if the server can do that. And then uh, in C, there's ng-HTTP2 and libh2o. Uh, so let's talk about uh, what's coming next uh, after HTTP2. So quick. Uh, it, it looks like Quick is going to be the next effort to uh, address the shortcomings that haven't been addressed yet in HTTP. Uh, so, and I think the, like, the big one is uh, TCP is uh, showing its age, and uh, it imposes uh, an ordering into, the, um, into the, the streams that might not be necessary anymore, or at least depending on the, on the content that you are serving, especially in video. It doesn't matter anymore if you've lost a couple of frames and you want to um, show the stream live. Um, in that case, it would make sense to use something else than TCP. So uh, another reason for that is that there have been many uh, modern modernization attempts for TCP that haven't really caught up because OSs don't, just don't evolve. And so shipping essentially the entire TCP stack as part of the application is going to be the workaround for that. Uh, where you can, uh, you know, uh, deploy new congestion control algorithms much faster than uh, can be, uh, what can be done today. 
so it has a working group. Uh, I was just uh, in a meeting in Seattle where we had an interim meeting. Um, and essentially, there are, I would say, about 10 different implementations of Quick, uh, which is the IETF version. Uh, and they did interop interoperability um, experiments uh, with each other. And they're actually today at the level of handshaking and, sorry, and, um, uh, sorry, OK. Uh, so yeah, so there are the level of handshaking and starting to have flow control implemented. But uh, I expect this is going to take a long time, and I would be surprised that we see uh, the IETF quick being formalized before a year or two. Uh, there's a number of uh, implementation already out there. The main one is based on Chrome source code. Uh, so Chrome has its own version of quick, which is Google quick. And they are going to slowly make Quick evolve towards the, uh, the ITF Quick. Uh, so if you go and look at the Chrome sources, um, they have uh, different version numbers. And on each one, they tagged uh, what they think they will get from the ITF. Uh, for example, the crypto is going to be replaced from an internal uh, Google uh, crypto to TLS 1.3. Uh, and so this is, uh, is going to be a big change that's going to come into the next version of Chrome, uh, or the next version of Quick, rather. Um, there's another Go, entirely written from scratch implementation, the Lucas Clemente one, uh, which I strongly recommend. It's uh, very well written, uh, easy to understand code. Uh, it's slightly easier to compile as well uh, than Chrome. And then on the client side, uh, there's an open source LS Quick client, which has been open sourced like uh, two weeks ago. Uh, that's working against the, the Google, uh, Google servers. And then for Android, there's a library that embeds uh, the, the quick, uh, uh, the quick uh, protocol. So to recap, uh, HTTP2 is really a browser transport protocol. So it's really the use case is really HTTP for the browsers. Uh, we've moved head of line blocking out of HTTP into TCP. And we have seen that uh, we've re left the remainder of the work to move that out of of line blocking to lower levels uh, to quick. And then in order to better understand the HTTP2 performance, uh, I think we need more uh, real world data. Uh, a long time, we've relied on the big players to, uh, to, uh, to give uh, them to us. Uh, on our side, we're making an effort to develop a client-side library in order to understand better how HTTP2 affects this. Uh, but uh, I would strongly encourage you, uh, if you have real world data, either uh, send, uh, send that to the HTTP working group mailing list or uh, you know, to your CDN. Uh, and I uh, would be happy to, uh, to assist you uh, with that. And, <laughs> and uh, that's it. <laughs> that's uh, that's the, uh, the end of the, the presentation. I see that we have uh, seven minutes. So if there are uh, any questions, I'm happy to take, uh, to take them. Yes? Yeah, so uh, hi. Thanks for your presentation. Yeah. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, my question is, um, how does reverse proxying actually fit in the HTTP2? And does it really, uh, does it alter the performance in some way? And when does it do it? Because I expect it would. Yeah. So the uh, the question is, uh, how does the, when you're doing reverse proxy, I assume to HTTP 1, right? Well, not necessarily. Okay. Uh, right, so when you, the question is, when you do reverse proxying, how does this affect performance uh, for HTTP and uh, uh, for HTTP 2? Uh, and so I think there are several ways. Um, the main thing is all about uh, caching. Uh, because uh, as we've seen, the only way to opt out streams is sending reset streams. Uh, if you've already written a lot of uh, data into the buffers of the proxy, uh, there might be things that you cannot take out. So if you are doing a reverse proxy at the TLS uh, level, for example, let's say that you have uh, one HA proxy, and then behind you have your HTTP2 uh, uh, server, then it means that by the time you receive the reset stream, you might have filled the TLS buffers of HA proxy already by megs worth of data that you cannot take back. Uh, and so there, there are efforts uh, inside H2O, for example, to look at the uh, RTT of the connection and to only send as much data as we think will fit into uh, the, uh, the round trip, one round trip to the client, so that uh, 
uh, the client can abort the, the stream as fast as possible and that we don't overcommit stuff to the network. Uh, this is all tied to buffer bloat, essentially, right? Because you have huge TCP buffers. And so if you've written, uh, pack them with useless data with an image, then you cannot take advantage of the full multiplexing that uh, TCP allows. Uh, this is something that Quick will address, obviously, because you won't be um, uh, tied necessarily to the, uh, to the frames that you've, uh, you've sent already to the wire. And so the, um, the client, for example, might just decide to drop them without even reading them. Uh, so I think that's one part. Uh, another thing when you translate from HTTP2 to HTTP1, uh, what you want is that uh, you actually are not re-reducing the number of connections that you have outstanding. So I would advise that to do in a way, uh, for example, uh, what we do is that locally we use Unix sockets. So there's no round trip for the connection establishment. There's no TLS since we're on the same box. And there's no limit into the amount of connections that H2O is gonna open to varnish. And so uh, your single TTP connection on one end on our boxes is gonna move to 100 connections on the TCP side. Uh, but that's something I would keep in mind if you're doing reverse proxy there. Um, and I think that's what's com what comes to mind. The other tricky thing is that if you wanna push stuff, then um, you, if you wanna take advantage of the server think time in HTTP one, uh, then the only mechanism you have today is that you can uh, send the early hints, but that's something not all servers support now. I actually don't know of any other server than H2O uh, that supports that. So it's uh, a bit limited in terms of uh, uh, interoperability, I would say. Yeah? Um, I wonder, do you have data on the server performance uh, changes? So we saw the bandwidth changes, you know? Yeah. Uh, I honestly haven't, I, I don't know. Uh, to give you an idea though, uh, we're doing, uh, and I do have like numbers of static benchmarks, but uh, what we're currently seeing is that we're doing uh, 15,000 requests a second, like real ones on the servers on a single core uh, for H2O. It only does the translation uh, from HTTP2 to HTTP1, so it doesn't do uh, like a lot, uh, but it's uh, like super fast. The, uh, this hasn't been a, an issue, uh, and uh, to go like a, a little bit deeper into your, your question, the, uh, when, when we look at the profiles, most of the time it's done decoding headers. Uh, so there's not a, like this shows, uh, I think to me, that the, the actual framing of the, of the protocol is actually well done because we, we're not spending any time in, into that. Yeah? Yeah. Usually the client does. Yes, so the, the question was, uh, if you server push, uh, whether about the priorities into the stream that you're pushing. Yeah, that's a good question. I, uh, I haven't talked about that. There's a, a window of time uh, between the push and even when you send a request uh, between you sending stuff and the priorities getting sent to the server. And so uh, at least in H2O, we have a default mechanism that kicks in where depending on the mind type of the response, we're gonna assign a fixed uh, set, uh, of, a fixed weight actually of the dependency. So we're gonna stick the resource under, uh, under stream zero, and then de depending on the mind type, uh, we're gonna assign a default uh, uh, priority. That's all configurable. You can have your own list of uh, mind types and different, uh, and different priorities for that. Right, so the question was, uh, can H2O do, do something about how the uh, connection reuse is done by the, the, by the browser? And I think there are uh, two things, but they're both experimental. Uh, the first one is uh, the 421 response, uh, which is a, misre a misdirected request. And the, that's supposed to trigger the browser to reopen another connection uh, to, in order to fetch the request. The other one is the origin frame. I've written, uh, 
It's a PR today in H2O uh, because it's a draft still. There's no, no, no RFC yet. Uh, but this will uh, allow to narrow the, the set of the certificate. But I think today the only sure proof way to do that is not to have the two names on the cert or, have, or, or resolve to different IPs. That's like the only way you're going to get the, uh, that's the only sure proof way to have the client work for all the browsers. Yeah? What, what made you choose H2O instead of, I don't know, Nginx or? Yeah. Uh, so the question was what made us choose H2O instead of uh, Nginx or Apache. Uh, I think it's mostly the code base. Uh, it was, uh, we were looking for something that was both fast and uh, that we could customize uh, with our needs. And uh, at least getting up to speed uh, uh, with uh, H2O has been like a breeze. It's, uh, I've been doing C for a very long time and, uh, and uh, servers uh, for a very long time. And I must say that uh, I was also, Almost convinced that uh, C wasn't a very good language for that, but uh, like the way H2O is written, we'll, I'll talk a, a little bit about that in de into detail, uh, makes it e actually safe and easy to hack into C. Uh, we obviously are using tools like Coverity and you know, fuzzers uh, to continuously fuzz uh, H2O, uh, but, uh, so there are all the dangers uh, of C to keep in mind. Uh, but it, it's, it's been working fairly well for us, uh, I would say. Uh, sorry, the, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting that uh, another thing is that uh, it has quite nice uh, features in terms of TLS. Uh, you can uh, fork a child that will hold the TLS secret so that your traffic and your uh, TLS uh, secrets are in two separate processes. So that's one uh, nice isolation to have, and that works out of the box with uh, OpenSSL. So that's a, that's a pretty cool feature that uh, we were particularly interested in. All right. Uh, well, so I think uh, we're, do we're done. We have like uh, 30 minutes uh, worth of uh, a break, and then uh, we'll restart at uh, 11 with, uh, and I'll present H2O in a little bit more of detail, and H2Get, which is a client uh, that we'll use to, uh, uh, to send frames. Thank you.